as video games think about like a vertical slice of your game, you should think about like a vertical slice of the IP of your game. Today, we make IP your business. It's a podcast that explores how intellectual property positions a company to succeed or stumble. We call this season Video Game Development, a quest for IP. Together, we take a journey exploring the role IP plays as a game gets created and launched. We also kick off a cross-regional network where you can exchange best practices, join online events, and sign up to get one-on-one advice from IP professionals. So we're doing a podcast about video games. Why are we here? So let me start. Um, my name is Allison Mages. I'm head of the IP commercialization section here at WIPO. And we're responsible for helping businesses maximize their potential through IP. And I'm Mikaela Mantegna. I like to define myself as an avo gamer, which is a, a pun of meaning a video game lawyer in Spanish. And I'm also a scholar at the Berman Clyde Center at Harvard. And I will be this season co-host. And I'm Gaetano Dimita. I'm a senior lecturer in intellectual property law at Queen Mary University of London. And my entire research and, uh, and teaching is focusing on games and interactive entertainment law. Let's talk a little bit about how we each got into video games. Michaela? The short version of this is I always been a gamer. And I love video games since I was a child. I love the ways that video games can tell stories and can let you like imagine yourself in roles, in different professions, in different stories. And for me, I think I have many, many games that I love through, through history, from Baldur's Gate in the beginning to Doom. But the game that kind of shifted my perspective into considering video games as a career was Mass Effect. Particularly one line, one quote, when one of the characters says, does this unit have a soul? It's a really profound line because it was like an android asking their creators if this unit has rights. So for me, it's what's sparked my interest in AI ethics, and that kind of influenced my background. And it's really cool to see how you can shift your profession, and the video game industry has a place for everyone. Wherever you are an artist, wherever you're a coder, a lawyer, the industry needs you, and that's how I ended up being here. That's awesome, Michaela. And so a place for everyone. Um, Gaetano, where's your place in the video game industry? Video games have been with me since the beginning. I actually don't remember which one was the, the first video game that I played. I've been with them since Atari, just to tell you all the them. But they've always been part of my life. And then I went to law school. I did a PhD in, in IP. And when they asked me, what do you want to teach? Uh, the answer came automatically. I want to teach uh, interactive entertainment. I want to teach video games. Because I, I find it fascinating. It's something I love and actually one of the most complex aspect of intellectual property law. So perfect, at least for me. (laughs) And I think, Gaetano, you know, we'll hear about what all those complex aspects of why IP really helps propel your video games um, and what you want to do with them throughout this series. So we all take a turn too. my first video game. I remember saving up for Mario Brothers. It was like that job where I was so excited to have my first console with Nintendo way back. So I've always had a love for video games. And this is why we're super excited here at WIPO to do this project. My background is more in the the business world. I spent about 15 years working for a Fortune 500 company on all sorts of different aspects of IP from helping create IP rights themselves as an inventor, working as a lawyer supporting the business, and then eventually helping with mergers and acquisitions. Gaetano, maybe starting with you, what does IP have to do with video games? Oh, everything. IP is only present. Video games on top, there's the, the creative and the innovative part, but then the way they get commercialized and the people designing video game actually get financial benefit and recognition for their creation. It is through IP. And uh, I was mentioning before that it's oh. complex because uh, IP with video games is dealing 
for the first time with works that are born digital and they are interactive. They, they involve the participation of the player. And this complexity, the fact that they are a global business, the fact that they are the result of a very complex contractual matrix and globally different form of regulation makes them an amazing and fascinating area of research. But of course, when you have to deal with them in practice, creates a lot of uh, questions. But IP is there and is there for the creators, is there for the innovators. So this is one of the aspects that we're going to try to to mystify. And also is the way they monetize. So it is very important. <laughs> Michaela, what about from your perspective? Why IP and video games? For me, what attracts me to IP is like I love how creativity intertwines with IP and how IP helps protecting your creativity. And at the same time, I was thinking that it's a very complex dance because as, as Gaetano was saying, video games are this complex creature that can have like different IPs on a single screenshot from a video game. You can find really different things. And as video games think about like a vertical slice of your game, you should think about like a vertical slice of the IP of your game. You can have trademarks uh, for uh, the name of your game. You can have copyright protection on your characters. You can have copyright on the script of your game, on the music. And it's very interesting because having adequate protection, not only for the market where you are creating it, but from the prospective markets you are thinking you are going to put your video game on, it's really important for for the success. And so it's interesting that you need to think ahead when you are creating your game about all these issues since the beginning, since the inception. So that's why what I found super interesting about this podcast is like going on each of one of these phases, taking into these little nuts and bolts of the issues that you need to pay attention with. Because it's not only just protecting your IP, but also making sure that you are not infringing in someone else's IP. Because as gamers, as fans, we know that we love to pay an homage to things. And sometimes people start in the video game industry by creating games that have these little elements that are meant with no harm and good intentions, but can give you a lot of trouble moving forward. Sometimes these are passion projects that end up being commercialized. So it's really important to have a really good IP education from transitioning to creating this something like a side hobby into a very professional project. And Gaetano, I think it's exactly this complexity that we're going to try and break down during the podcast. Now, here's a preview for all of you listening about what you'll hear during this season. We're breaking it up into five different levels. And in each level, we explore a different stage of video game development with companies ranging from industry giants like Riot Games, Tencent, CD Projekt Red and Konami, to indie developers like Makla Interactive and Green Horse Games. We want you to hear from people who have been there about how IP impacted their business. So we're starting at the concept phase and then move to development and launch. And then finally, we dive into the challenges and opportunities in using intellectual property to help game developers navigate IP and understand when to ask for professional support. A special feature of each level are our power-ups. These are one-page checklists that cover key IP concepts at each level. Now, speaking of power-ups, Gaetano, we're in the tutorial today. Can you walk us through the different IP rights and how they relate to video game development? Yes, there are a multitude of intellectual property rights. They are there to protect some subject matter against some uses. And generally, focusing on on the big one, the one they're going to mention the most, we have copyright. Copyright is the right that is accorded to creators, to authors, for the creation of their minds. It encompasses almost everything in a video game, from the underlying software to any single uh, audiovisual element, the expression of the storyline, the music, the dialogues, the text, and so forward. Everything that is original and is expressed is going to be protected by copyright. And copyright is, uh, we're going to get back to this a lot in the course of the episode, because you get protection at the time of creation or at the time of fixation, depending where you are, and it's automatic. You don't need any registration. So it's there even if you don't know that it's there. 
On the other side, they are registered right. They are equally important. We will touch on trademarks, on design, and on patent. Trademarks is the right that protects the logo, the symbols, the to some extent, the, the sound, everything that is distinctive and creates a connection with your company, with your business, and actually differentiate your business as the origin of that particular good and services to all the other uh, companies. Trademark is different with copyright. You have to register. You have to apply for a registration to a trademark office, and you have to specify the countries in which you want to be protected and the categories of goods and services that you want protection on. So if you don't get the protection, if you don't make the application, you don't have the trademark in that particular sign that you want to use. And think about you know, the name of the company, the name of the video game, the name of the main character, but don't limit yourself to that. You can protect by trademark, uh, for instance, uh, a particular weapon that is particularly is important for your game. And maybe you want to create some merchandising around, but also uh, sound. And to some extent, uh, you can also register a trademark as an audiovisual mark, so as some aspect of your gameplay, even though we're going to get into these details, but it's fascinating. It's something that you could, in theory, do. Then the patent. Uh, patent is, is normally the one that is looked at with more suspicious from, from the video game industry, in particular the, the small game developers, because they're really, really afraid of getting sued for a patent infringement. Because, of course, you can infringe a patent even if you don't know that there is a patent of that particular invention, and they're worried about the expenses. But it's always overlooked the importance of patent. Patent is a 20 years monopoly granted on an invention. And so it permits you to actually control how your invention is used by anyone else. You can license it or you can stop others using your own invention. Patenting being so strong, not only you have to register, but you have to apply for a patent. You have to apply for a patent specifying what the claims are, what your invention is, describing it, and then you apply to a patent office. And at the patent office, an examiner is going to examine your invention and the claims that you want to include in your patent. And if you're successful, you will be granted a patent for 20 years in the jurisdiction in which you applied for a patent. So this is just an overdue, just a touch. We're going to get back to them in, in, in the power-up and in particular in the clinics. There's going to be a lot of practical discussion on this aspect of IP. Gaetano, why do you think the industry has developed this way in this more open to letting other people use your IP kind of approach? I guess because the, the business model is based on being known and retain your player. So in some way, I mean, this aspect like streaming and esports, and obviously there are exceptions because the industry is massive and there are very different companies that are within this industry. So their approach may, I don't want to generalize too much, but basically the business model is about maintaining your, your player happy so they keep playing the game and directly or indirectly they keep paying. So there is a, an intention to have people playing and uh, this creativity, the really creativity based on the video games actually increase the accessibility to the game in the sense more people find out about the game and the player themselves uh, being creative with the game, they spend more time on the game. So it's creativity fostering creativity. So it is interesting to see how it's going to evolve. But for instance, moving forward, and, and Michaela mentioned the metaverse, the video game industry could be um, you know, a case studies for, for, for the rest of our more immersive online life because of this capacity of maintaining, governing, and dealing with IP within online communities. A lot of successes of cross-licensing of, of, of IP, mainly trademark, has been done on video games or curiously on movie about video games. <laughs> so this incredible negotiation between hundreds, if not thousands of IP owners in order to create a new environment is, is a story that you only see in video games. In other industries, much rarer. Gaihana, you were talking about how licensing is such a big deal. Michaela, how do people really make money from games? Is it the game itself or is it through other kinds of things like merchandising and expansions across media? That's a fantastic question because video games have really different business models. At the end of the day, it's going to be not only 
the one that you thought, but the one that uh, makes more sense to your business. So Gatana was mentioning the secondary markets that you can get ancillary revenue, for example, like licensing the creation of figurines. There is a huge market of collectibles. You can have expansion to books, not to quote every single time Mass Effect, but I remember that dude, that is a, a, the game that was an original IP uh, created for a video game. And that expanded into a series of books. There was a movie and at some point that it was going, they were talking to, to create a movie. And that's interesting because video games used to work like the other way around, like adaptations from uh, already existence IP. And now we are witnessing how digitally born video games are creating IPs that are adapted into other medias. Like we were talking about Edge Runner series on Netflix. So it's interesting how the versatility of how you can tell stories and the markets you can reach with this. So in terms of your IP strategy, it makes sense to think uh, with, your, with your strengths that your video game, and it's not this is not just for AAA games. You have really successful indie games. I'm thinking about Cupheads, for example, that was like a huge success. They ended up being supported by Microsoft and Xbox on this. But it was started as an independent studio. And for people that is listening that's not from the video game area, this is a video game that used traditional techniques from animation to create like this feeling of a 50s cartoon. And they end up having a massive, massive market in terms of t-shirts, figurines, and they ended up having an adaptation in Netflix with a series. The possibilities with your games are limitless, but you have to have into account your IP strategy. And also, even if you are not doing, uh, I don't know, like this, an animated series, we were talking about Cyberpunk, know where you can find allies to enhance the IP you are creating. I think it's incredible, uh, Michaela, that people are who are creating this IP that does go off and expand in huge ways, they're often indie studios starting out for the first time who may not have been thinking about all these potential expansions as they were newer to the business. And that's pretty incredible. And that's it for our tutorial. Now tune in and join us this season with Riot Games, Macla Interactive, Tencent, CD Projekt Red, Konami, and Green Horse Games to hear about how IP affected their businesses and how it can help you and your video game succeed. Thanks for listening to Make IP Your Business. This podcast is brought to you by WIPO, the UN agency for IP that enables innovation and creativity for everyone, everywhere. You can find all the episodes, download the power-ups, and join the community on our website. Check out the show notes for the links. Now see you in level one.